Hi, I'm Scott Sabin, uh, the Chief Executive Officer at Plant With Purpose, and I'm here with our Chief Operating Officer, Paul Thompson, and we're here to talk about the way that uh, faith is integrated into our work and why we think that's so important. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be here with you, and it's great to be with uh, all of you as well. You know, one of the things that uh, we're known for at Plant With Purpose is our commitment to environmental restoration economic empowerment, and spiritual renewal. But I'd like to have you, Scott, if you would, take a moment and talk about the genesis of our commitment to spiritual renewal. Why is that important to us? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Well, I wanna start by saying everything that we're able to accomplish is by the grace of God. We have enjoyed unusual favor this past year and uh, as I was talking with uh, many of our directors in the field, uh, much of it, nothing short of miraculous. And uh, it's tempting to think of uh, the spiritual side of our work as, as just a side, just an aspect. But really, it is, it is so integrated. And, and I have to start off by, by giving glory to God for what we've been able to do. Well, we're working in some of the most difficult countries in the world. Um, places where open warfare is often the norm, um, in the midst of a global pandemic. Right. And the fact that we've been able to uh, persevere, that we've been able to make a difference, that we've seen hope and good news through that, really is, is a testimony to God's hand in our work. And so I, I just wanna, wanna start by saying that. I, I think it's really important that we never miss the opportunity to give glory to God for what he is allowing us to participate in. But to your original question, yeah. um, we were motivated from day one by the love of Jesus, um, inspired by what Christ had done for us to make a difference in the lives of people around the world. And as we did that originally by um, helping people to grow more food and restore their land and to plant trees, we realized that even as we were changing the nature of their water resources, we had living water to offer. Mm -hmm. and, and it's often struck me that if all we're offering is the water that flows in their local stream and yet Christ has given us living water, we're missing a huge opportunity. So as you have, you, you spoke a moment ago about the integration of our work together, these three particular areas. Can you speak to how we have integrated spiritual renewal into the core of our connection with our partners in the field where, where we're working? Yeah, um, let me just for a second though, talk about uh, some of the very practical um, aspects that we've discovered, you know, even as it was a, a part of, of our goals and our motivation from the very beginning, um, we've learned that it, it uh, ends up making everything work better. Um, Durbell told me an amazing um, story about how making people um, more prosperous doesn't transform their lives. And, and I remember our, our, um, our first director in the Dominican Republic told me a similar story that they found that uh, as people became more wealthy, they would um, oftentimes spend their, their newfound wealth on, on rum mm -hmm. and uh, you know, said in order, um, more alcohol, a TV and a mistress. And uh, we realized that, right. that when we're talking about transformation, that's not what we're talking about. Um, and we've learned that it makes all other aspects or all other parts of what we're doing um, much more effective um, because it's the change in attitude that really makes people um, or gives people the, the hope and the sense of agency that they need to start to change their situation. One of the strengths of our program is the spiritual renewal aspect of our program. Uh, because, uh, yes, there are other angels down here, uh, but you would see uh, even the government acknowledges that. How is it possible, guys, that we are having that great impact? And we say 
and even myself, I believe it's because of the spiritual renewal component. Um, so, um, like when we we are campaigning for tree uh, for, for for tree planting, which is one uh, core aspect of our activity that we are doing, people tend to respond not not because we are telling them to participate, but because they have already understand that is God is calling us to take care of his creation. Este, cuando tenemos un taller de identidad y vocación, como decía, lo, lo basamos en la historia de, de la creación, en el principio del relato bíblico en Génesis, como Dios, eh, nos, eh, cuando Él quiso crear al hombre, dijo creemos al hombre, pero necesitaba, uh, pues tener, digo yo, un modelo ¿no? de cómo crearlo y se tomó a sí mismo como ese modelo y dijo hagámoslo a nuestra imagen y semejanza y le dio una tarea, un propósito dijo y señoré en, en, la, en los peces del mar, en las aves de los cielos y en, en toda la tierra y en todo animal que se arrastra sobre la tierra y entonces nos preguntamos con las personas qué significa la palabra señorear y la palabra señorear significa administrar, ¿sí? Pero esa administración debe hacerse conforme a los principios que Dios estableció, de una forma responsable, de una forma justa. Entonces, la, eh, vemos también en Génesis 2.15 que el Señor eh, tomó al hombre y lo puso en el huerto del Edén. ¿Y para qué lo puso en el huerto del Edén? para que lo labrara y para que lo cuidara. Entonces reconocemos que, que por lo menos te, le dio tres tareas a Adán. Trabajar la tierra, cuidarla y ser un mayordomo responsable de ella. Y, y es así como se empiezan a, a, a planificar algunas actividades. También eh, como compartía las personas eh, al, a, al analizar que somos personas creadas por Dios, hechas a su imagen y semejanza, pues concluimos que somos personas muy valiosas y que también Dios nos dio un potencial que está ahí para salir adelante. Hay muchas otras cosas que podríamos hacer. Por ejemplo, yo podría pilotear un avión. ¿Tengo el potencial para hacerlo? Claro que sí. Solo que no es ahorita mi necesidad o mi interés aprender a pilotear una nave, pero yo puedo aprender muchas cosas y, y ellos dicen, sí, nosotros también. Y, y entonces, ¿qué cosas podemos aprender? ¿Qué cosas, qué habilidades queremos desarrollar? Vamos a trabajar en ello y también en reconocer nuestros dones, nuestros talentos. Ha habido veces que, que solamente estamos en un grupo de puras mujeres y preguntamos, ¿qué, qué sabemos hacer? ¿Qué dones tenemos? Yo no sé hacer nada. ¿Está segura? Porque usted hace unas tortillas muy grandes que yo no sé hacer. Usted cultiva unas hortalizas, sabe sembrar maíz y frijol y es algo que yo no sé hacer. Yo no sé producir alimentos y usted sí. Usted sabe hacer muchas cosas. Ah, es cierto. And so we've incorporated it into our theory of change, really the... the the document and the map that explains how do we get from where we are to where we want to go. And part of where we want to go is helping people to change their relationships with God, with their neighbors, with the environment, and with themselves. And the only way to do that is by them taking on some spiritual change. Um, but it's more than that. It's intentional. And in, in, in response to your question, Uh, we, we work very closely in partnership with the local churches. Mm -hmm. We believe that the local church is God's chosen instrument for change in a community. And mm -hmm. most of the places we work, churches already exist. We're working in a lot of uh, predominantly Christian communities, not all. We work in communities that are, are Muslim and, and Buddhist. But, but uh, where there is a church, we partner very closely with a local church. Um, and we pray, provide training for church leaders. You know, and, and again, Richard uh, in Tanzania uses a curriculum uh, called uh, redemptive agriculture. And one of the things it brings out is the value of farming. 
a lot of the subsistence farmers and smallholder farmers around the world have been taught that, that they really don't have anything to offer. I mean, the economy teaches them you know, to make a dollar a day or less. So the economy doesn't value what they have to offer. Um, oftentimes their own governments don't value what they have to offer. You know, they consider them to be the backwards people. Right. Right. And, um, and the church has traditionally had nothing to offer other than the hope of salvation. You know, the gospel doesn't apply to anything you do today. But this curriculum that uh, we're teaching, uh, Redemptive Agriculture, talks about how God is the, was the first farmer. God created a garden and placed Adam in the garden to tend it and to keep it and has given us the same task. And what's, what's exciting about that is that people who've considered that what they were doing, you know, digging, you know, didn't contribute anything, barely to their own families. Now they see themselves as actually having a role in God's plan and being able to contribute to God's kingdom as stewards of creation. I know you and I have talked uh, several times about some of the impact that you've uh, you've seen in our the communities around the world where we're working. Can you recall to mind some of those particularly um, impactful moments where you've seen the result of spiritual resilience and, and spiritual renewal in our communities? Yeah, um, and and as I was talking with with our directors uh, this past week, uh, they shared a lot of other stories as well. But uh, some of the most uh, poignant ones to me uh, were in um, in Eastern Congo in the DRC, and yeah. talking to people who had grown up um, with this incredible conflict, mm -hmm. deep seated conflict, and and in an environment where in which men didn't do much. And uh, Barori shared some stories with me about, you know, there's actually a, a saying in one of the, one of the communities that if, if, if a man's married, he shouldn't do anything. I mean, that's, that's kind of his, his, his place if he's, got, if he's got a wife. And so to see people valuing their wives, working alongside them, to see reconciliation within the family, to see, People not only not only changing the way they treat their wives, but changing the way they feel about themselves, mm -hmm. as they realize they have something to offer. Mm -hmm. You know, a story that that I, I've shared for a number of years, but of a, a a former warlord in um, that I happened to be talking to. I haven't actually spent a couple of days walking with him in Eastern Congo. I didn't know his history at the time, but mm -hmm. sitting down and, and talking with him, and he tell he told me. Um, uh, you know, we didn't do anything. We just sat around and played cards. And then your pastor came and told me that work was a gift from God. And I thought, maybe I have something I can contribute. Maybe, maybe I have some talents. And, and he said, as, as if it was a, a light bulb going off, I thought, maybe if I help my wife on the farm, we could do something great. But the cool thing about that story is he is still doing that. And there has been a culture shift in those communities. Barari has some other stories mm -hmm. about that, um, which, which only comes from, from a heart transformation. The other thing he told me, because I was trying to get it, what, what's the spiritual background of this? Said, so, so did you become a Christian? And he said, no, I've always been a Christian. I just never knew it applied to anything besides Sunday before. And, you know, we often think of that as a, as a malady that's peculiar to the yeah, church in right. America. But really, all of our directors told us, uh, uh, told me stories like that. You know, uh, one of the things that uh, Durbel was sharing is that, um, that a lot of the churches that they deal with have nothing outside of their Sunday service. So there is no tradition of Bible study. And so as the groups... The savings groups do a devotional and start to read the Bible and start to study the Bible. A light comes on there. It's um, yeah, it's been really fun to see that. Talk about what you have experienced over the years uh, in Plant with Purpose, as you've seen us integrate these aspects of environmental restoration, economic empowerment, and spiritual renewal. 
how have the communities become stronger because of the integration of those three elements? Well, I'm, I'm really glad you asked because we didn't always integrate them. I think that we've always had these three elements, mm -hmm. but there was a time when you could travel and you'd see, you'd see a church program over here and you'd see a farming project over there and you'd see a savings group in a third place. And what we learned is that there's a, a tremendous synergy between these three elements. And there's been actually some, some research and studies showing mm -hmm. how um, savings groups and agricultural training and rest, land restoration together right. are more effective than either one. Mm -hmm. But the third element of, of spiritual renewal is, is dramatic mm -hmm. because of what it does for the, the attitudes. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, Richard shared with me is that Plant With Purpose participants have a noticeably different work ethic than anybody else around them. And, and another thing we measure is do people take satisfaction in their work? And we yeah. see a, a noticeable change there. Um, it really, it, from a practical standpoint, it acts as, as, a, as something that accelerates all of the other dynamics. The other thing um, that we hear a lot about is, is how it brings about uh, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And Barori had a story for me. Um, he's had a number of stories along this way. Um, again, and I, I, I really have to stress the history of yeah. conflict that he's dealing with. Mm -hmm. But he told, us, told me a story of a couple of, of women that were in the same savings group. And they really had a problem with each other. Uh, but working alongside each other, and part of what's being taught in the savings group is unity, and um, and they're hearing the same message in church. Mm -hmm. um, it, it ultimately led to them um, reconciling, um, forgiveness between them, a change in their their faith, and and the two of them are in business together now. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Talk about some of the experiences that you've had uh, with our country directors as you've talked about in our planning. I know you've got, we've got collectively some big plans in spiritual renewal for the coming year. Talk about some of those plans. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that, that I'm excited about this year is bringing together as much of, of the, the combined wisdom Mm -hmm. of our teams as we can. You know, everybody works in their own context and, and having the, the rare privilege of getting to visit um, each of them and to know each of them. I know, for example, I shared earlier about the redemptive agriculture piece that, that Richard is teaching and the theology of work that uh, Barori and Noah are teaching and, that, and the uh, church community and change that is taking place in, in Mexico. And each of them have their treasures. I, I think of the, the uh, I can't think of the, the pa exact passage, but in Revelation where it talks about the treasure of the nations being brought together. I think a little bit of, of, of that is what I'm hoping for is each of them brings the wisdom that they've learned and to develop a, a shared curriculum where the best mm -hmm. of what God has taught us is being is being shared. And so each country can learn from the other. And so that's a, a big initiative this year is putting together this right. shared plant with purpose, spiritual right. renewal curriculum. And I, I'm really excited about that. Um, I think the other thing you mentioned was prayer mm -hmm. and uh, our, our uh, uh, former colleague used to refer to that as our secret weapon, but uh, we, in addition to praying regularly, individually, and as teams in each country, once a month, yeah. throughout Plant With Purpose, and first Friday of the month, we gather to pray for each other. And I just love the, the idea that, um, you know, in Congo, they're praying for Haiti, yeah. and in Thailand, they're praying for Mexico, 
and we're sharing one another's burdens, both personal, professional, yeah. and and that's a, a regular and ongoing thing. And it's and it's something that everybody can participate in. Yeah. By the way, um, if you're interested in joining us on the first Friday of the month or in your own time, we have a monthly prayer letter, and would love to to right. have more people on the prayer team joining us in that. So, Scott, you've alluded to the relationship that we have with churches in the communities where we're working. Can you talk specifically kind of about how we're engaging our interest in spiritual renewal with our partnership with churches? Sure. Well, a lot of the churches have relatively weak leadership. Maybe it's one pastor serving a whole bunch of churches or a pastor who is not not very well educated. Mm -hmm. And so it has been our, our intent to come alongside them, to help them. Um, that's where we share things like theology of work, um, like redemptive agriculture, church community and change, mm -hmm. uh, the Emoja curriculum, which helps churches to get involved in their communities and to take on project basically to become relevant to the community and to serve the community. So all of our directors have told me stories about how churches for the first time are getting active in, in helping the poor. Mm -hmm. There's a, a churches in, in Haiti that are building houses um, for, the, for the homeless. Right. There's churches in the Dominican Republic that have started literacy projects. There's churches in Tanzania and in Congo that have taken on um, land restoration projects. Um, there's churches that are starting to care for the elderly and, and, and as an outreach project work on their land. But it's really turned out to be a, a, a very symbiotic thing. As the churches are doing that, they're growing. And as they're growing, they're investing back in us. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things Richard shared with me, apparently a lot of people in, in Tanzania will, if, they, if they're very poor and they don't have anything to bring in terms of offering, will often avoid church. And so there's there's an element of right. now I can go to church because I have something to give. And so that's increased church attendance. Mm -hmm. And as people have been helped by the church, they've they've in turn started attending the church. Um, there's been reconciliation between churches. One of my favorite mm -hmm. stories is the way the churches in um, in the Kakumba watershed in uh, eastern Congo are now collectively we're, we're not even fully aware of each other before, and, and often when they were, we're in competition with each other. Now, collectively, they have become the, the conscience for the people there. Mm -hmm. They have taken care of relief projects in terms of helping refugees and so forth. So they, they really have established themselves cool. as, as something very relevant and, and, and very much um, leadership in those communities. So I, I, I really like that. And then, and then the cycle continues as the church becomes our am ambassador. Uh, Richard was telling me a story of pastors actually having our group members stand up and give testimonies about what they've gained wow. from Planet Purpose and how other people can be involved with Planet Purpose. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a wonderful virtuous cycle. That's cool. People are hopeless. And the people maybe they said, okay, am I living this life? Okay, this is enough. I don't have the ability to change. But when you train about the theology of work, people start having like purpose, having like a, another vision, starting just realizing, okay, I can change. I can improve. I can maybe uh, become another one, like not me present, but I'm able just to change in the near future. So this is almost, that was something we observed. Pero gracias a Dios, a la parte de renovación espiritual, gracias a Dios, a la integración de esta parte, estamos desarrollando personas, agricultores y agricultoras equilibrados que con amor a Dios 
Y también cuando tú amas a Dios, tú amar a tu esposa, tú amar a tus hijos y tú a amar a tu prójimo. Y no, y, y sabe es que esas cosas realmente no son buenas ante los ojos de Dios. Entonces, yo diría que nuestro trabajo sin la parte espiritual, yo diría que no sirve casi para nada. Porque lo importante es la, la transformación de las personas, que la persona pueda conocer de Dios. Y cuando la persona conoce de Dios, se convierte, como dice la Biblia, en una nueva criatura. Ya deja de hacer las cosas que hacía antes. Ya solamente piensas en las cosas que le agradan a Dios. Entonces, por eso, esa, yo diría que es la parte más importante del programa. La parte espiritual. Que los agricultores conozcan de Dios. Que las agricultoras conozcan de Dios. Porque la vida cambia, la vida es diferente. Y, y a mí me da alegría yo visitar, por ejemplo, personas que conozco. Y cómo esas personas pueden, que antes no, no sabían hacer una oración, y cómo esa persona ahora le piden con sinceridad al Señor Dios. O sea, eso me llena a mí de satisfacción. Y conozco muchas personas, así que la conocía antes como eran. Y ahora son personas totalmente diferentes. Christ gives each of us a, a unique an identity and, and, and each of us have value. And as I frequently mentioned subsistence farmers smallholder farmers have often been taught that they have little or nothing to offer and so the idea that god values them values their work has given each of them unique talents mm -hmm. to use on behalf of god's kingdom is is revolutionary and that's something that all of us are teaching in one form or another but really hoping to To, to share that and, and make that uh, uh, more central. You know, one of the things, the unifying things that goes through what we're teaching everywhere is the idea that each of us, whether here in the United States or on a subsistence farm in, in East Africa, each of us has been given the unique privilege of working alongside God for his redemptive purposes. God has, has allowed us to be a part of his plan for redemption for, for the environment, for the globe, for the world. And uh, that's, that's really exciting stuff. Um, we each get to participate in sharing the good news of the kingdom through our, through our words and through our work. Yeah. What a privilege it is to be able to reflect God's love and grace and mercy every day in the work that we do. Amen. Scott, thank you for this time. I want you to know what a privilege I consider it to be able to work with you every day in this work. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your commitment to spiritual renewal and for the work that we're doing collectively. Now, thank you, Paul. It is, it is a real blessing to work with you as well. Thank you.